The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone to the Rebel Capitalist Show that is one of my buddies down under. I used to live in Australia. He is right there, boots on the ground. And I get tons of requests to have Martin on the show. So I'm really happy. Martin, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. Hi, uh, George. Great to be here. And uh, yeah, I've also had lots of people say, you must talk to George. So it's great to be, we've actually been able to do it. Yeah, for sure. Now, for my viewers that might not know your background, uh, the, the Americans or the Europeans, can you go into that and kind of fill in the blanks for us? Yeah, sure. So I've been running uh, Digital Finance Analytics, which is actually my firm for a good number of years. And we basically survey households and then we do a lot of financial modeling and analytics about uh, what's going on in Australia. Uh, and uh, a couple of years ago, I then started the uh, YouTube channel. So there's a Walk the World channel, which is my YouTube channel, which is going extremely well. I do a bit on Twitter. But essentially what I've tried to do here is look at the whole issue of finance from a household perspective, right? So uh, there's a lot of talk out there about loans and about banks and what they're doing, but there is very little real understanding of how this is impacting real households and real businesses. So through our surveys and through our analysts, we come the other end and say, what's it like you know, for a household with, with a mortgage and loans and everything else at the moment? And uh, so that's the unique that we bring. And then obviously we bring a bit of perspective in terms of how that fits into the broader dynamics of the finance sector and uh, what banks are doing and all those good things, particularly now, of course, with so many uncertainties. Yeah. Now, is your research specific towards Australia? Because when I've watched a lot of your videos, I know you talk about macro, you talk about the Fed, quantitative easing, you talk about all this stuff. Yeah, so the surveys are just Australia. Uh, so, you know, a 52,000 rolling household survey running, running each week. Uh, but, of course, you can't do this in isolation from what's going on globally in the financial system. And, frankly, the Fed has huge influence, you know, everywhere. You know, even what happens down here in Australia and what the Reserve Bank does here is, in a way, mirroring and, uh, you know, reacting to what the Fed is doing. So, I've always believed you have to understand the global flows of both capital and power to be able to understand what's going on in the financial system and how that then translates down to you know individual mortgages and, and, and other things. So I try to join the dots because my, my, my real feeling is many people really haven't got much of a feel of what really is going on and why some of the things are happening the way they're happening. Oh, I, I totally agree. So you touched on mortgages briefly, and I know a lot of the questions I get, even from Americans and Canadians, is about the Aussie housing market or the Aussie housing bubble, however you want to frame it. So uh, I know you've done a ton of research there. Can you walk us through how you see that? Yeah. So uh, we have had huge inflation in house prices over the last 20 to 30 years. We went through the global financial crisis and hardly noticed down here. Um, and, you know, if, if you look at it in absolute terms, the proportion of households with a mortgage and the size of that mortgage is way off the scale. We're, uh, I think, only second after Switzerland if you look at uh, debt to GDP. And if you look on some other metrics, we've actually got the biggest debts for anybody. And our house prices have gone through the roof. So, you know, the average uh, loan to income ratio for a, for a mortgage in Sydney now is still eight or nine times which is wow. remarkably high. What, what is of, L.A., uh, Martin? Do you know? Uh, just about to, about th three, three to four would be typical. So, my you know, we, so it's yeah, twice L.A. Yeah, exactly right. And, and the problem we've got here is that we've, having, we've got this, um, if you like, housing bubble, but it's not just happened by accident, right? There has been a deliberate strategy since the global financial crisis to essentially pump up households and household finances so that they spend more and consume more. And uh, the banks took their um, lending standards down through the floor and basically just said, well, that's fine, take, a, take another loan, feel free. Uh, and so what we have now is a massive burden of debt. And I was calling this out before the, the immediate crunch that we've now got with, with, with the virus, right? We had so many households that were already in huge stress. So we measure something called mortgage stress, which is effectively a cash flow measure of how they're actually dealing with their mortgages. And before this whole thing started, we had 32% of households struggling to make mortgage repayments already, right? And now that's gone up to 37% in the last month because of what's happened with the economic slowdown. So, so we have a... a, a, um, a 
household housing situation that is completely pumped up, also pumped up by the fact we had lots of uh, migrants coming into Australia. We had lots of overseas people buying. We had a huge growth in property investment. So, you know, property investors were given tax breaks to basically just go out and uh, take more properties. So we have many property investors with six, seven, eight, 10, 15 properties. Uh, and whilst that may be great when things are going up, but of course, if prices start to slide, and particularly if you've crossed leverage one property to the next property to the next property, which is what people do, then essentially this can get uh, pretty awful pretty quick. And so as cash flow now is being compressed and is under pressure, we are seeing the risks in the mortgage sector really rising. And the high house prices that we've got at the moment look to me to be beginning to come the other way. And my own modeling suggests that uh, we could see uh, forty percent drops in home prices because if you come back to you know typical standard ratios, then we're forty percent on average over where we should be. So like there is huge, in- huge downside risk. Like like with the price to income. Yeah, price to income, uh, price to GDP. Um, you know, all all, all of, whichever way you look at it. And and the problem is if you build up what it costs to buy a plot of land and you know b- build a place on it and even allowing for the amenities, you're still 40% below what you're actually paying. So people are paying way too much for frankly <laughs> relatively standard prices of fraud. You know, million dollar, two million, three million, four million dollars for properties that really shouldn't be worth that. And that's really now sucked out so much life out of the economy because it means that people have less money to spend on other things. Uh, They're absolutely caught with very large mortgages. And whilst um, interest rates now uh, you know, the, the very low and, you know, the RBA's cut the rates, um, they can't keep doing that. So effectively, we've now got the situation where we've got this massive debt overhang and now the economy is looking extremely wobbly. Yeah. So with mortgages there, do they have a 30 year fixed rate product like we have in the States? No, most of the people are on variable rates. And, uh, you know, the typical mortgage is 20 or 30 years, but it's a, mostly a variable rate. About um, about um, 10%, 15% perhaps will have a short-term fixed rate that then needs to be reset every two, three, five years. But most people are on variable rates, which means that when rates come down, um, right. they get the benefits, assuming the banks pass it on, which they don't always do. But it also means that if rates were to start to go up, then people would get hit immediately. So so people tend to have this um, this revolving, um, you know, moving rate. And interestingly, quite a few people, uh, when rates, interest rates have been coming down very fast in the last couple of years, uh, a lot of people didn't reduce their repayments. So they've actually been making more repayments than the minimum. So there are some people who are actually quite doing quite well. So they're ahead of the curve. Well, maybe a third of, of mortgage holders. And uh, recently, one of the banks has said, well, what we're going to do is we're now going to take your repayments down to the minimum so that you've got more cash, right? Without actually asking whether you want it, they're just going to say, we're going to do that. It gives you a bit of a sense of the way the banks work here. But the, the fact of the matter is that you've got a lot of people with these you know, big mortgage commitments and um, they have found it more and more difficult just to make end meet, you know, Incomes have not grown for the last seven, eight years. Um, Cost of living are rising very fast. Mortgages are way bigger. And so the financial pressure on households are just dramatic. Okay, so I got a lot of questions there. First and foremost, um, that that's exactly what we did in the States. Like, like that's if you just took it straight out of the playbook, that's just bam, bam, bam. Step one, you do this. Step two, you do this. Between 2001 and call it 2006, it's it's shocking that that they would not or they wouldn't have learned anything from that. I guess what what their position is, they're not uh, securitizing all of the mortgages, so they're thinking, oh, this isn't a problem because even if it does blow up, it's just exclusive to the housing sector. But if the housing sector is that big a component of GDP. I mean, are, are they not seeing that? That would be question number one. Question number two is how are the average people coming up with the down payment? Yeah, well, let's take the second question first and then come back to the other one. Yeah, um, it's taking a long time for people to save. So essentially, um, it's taking now four to five times as long as it used to for people to be able to put that initial um, uh, deposit together. And, and it used to be you needed, you know, 15, 20 percent, maybe 10 percent if you if you if you're lucky. But then the the, the government came out with a scheme um, a few months ago to say, oh, look, what we'll do is we'll guarantee the gap between 80 and 95 percent. So you only need a five percent deposit because they're so keen to try and pull people in. Right. And I kept saying, hang on a moment. You're bringing people into the market with a five percent five percent deposit at the absolute peak of the market. Right. 
And already now we're seeing a lot of those people who actually took those loans now seeing the property prices fall. So creating huge negative equity. Uh, and in terms of the other question, which is about securitization, um, yeah, there is some securitization here. It's not as uh, widespread as uh, in some other countries. But um, it is part of the landscape, particularly the, the non-bank sector. So that's been growing quite fast. And in fact, we had a Royal Commission a couple of years ago, which criticised the banks for their poor lending practices. And that gave a bit of an in for the non-bank sector. And a lot of those non-banks are actually um, funded by hedge funds. <laughs> as well as securitization, because they could see that the returns were remarkable in Australia. So we have, you know, everyone was thro throwing big loans out and, uh, you know, saying, yeah, just ha have some more. But it goes back to the fundamental point, which you make it, you know, wake up, guys. This was actually already a traffic accident yeah, we've seen after the global yeah. financial crisis. You could see it happening. You could see it building, right? And, and they took rates down and just said, no, 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 the mining sector's off. So we have to actually find something else. So the Reserve Bank said we're going to get the uh, household sector to basically be the dynamo of growth. So about half of GDP in Australia is directly related to consumption. But of course, consumption has been dropping quite considerably, even before the current situation. And that's because incomes have not been rising. They're much more mortgaged. And uh, you could see that this was going to be a significant issue. And frankly, the problem I have is that almost nobody in government nor in you know those regulators like the Reserve Bank were worried about the debt. They said, no, debt's not a problem. And of course, it's basic, basic theory is it doesn't matter because for every debt that goes up, you have an asset that goes up, right? So it's basically two sides of the balance sheet, just gets bigger. Trouble is, now it doesn't work like that, right? Because essentially what's happening is that banks have been able to create money, you know, Another loan, yeah, sure, another electronic entry, and that then flows back into the economy and just lifts everything up. So prices get bigger, um, <clears throat> people get more leveraged, and unfortunately, it's fine in a rising market, but as soon as the music stops, um, it turns sour very quickly. And the trouble is that once that negative momentum starts to come in, then the chances are it will drop quite a lot. So we're already seeing first-time buyers stepping back. Um, we've got no migration now. We had 300,000 people last year, no migration now because of the virus. Um, we've got property investors trying to sell properties. So they're trying to sell into a falling market. And, and you, you can just see now the traffic accident that, that, that's waiting to happen. And meantime, of course, the banks are sitting on this huge pile of debt. 60 to 70 percent of all their portfolios, loan portfolios, are for residential property. So they're basically like big building societies, right? They don't do much else. And what they've done is then starve the broader economy of investment for business. So businesses right. have found it very hard to be able to get the um, the, the sort of um, funding that they need to be able to develop what they want to do. So they've all been focusing on just pumping up this household debt and these these big mortgages and this, you know, and, and now the property sector, I think, is going to catch a real big cold. And unfortunately, 37% uh, of households are now in mortgage stress. My modeling suggests that by August, we could be up to 41 to 42% of households. So that's a huge proportion. And unfortunately, it's differentially tilted towards those who are perhaps, you know, financially less capable and um, perhaps, you know, don't really quite understand what they've got into. Quite a few people got interest only loans, for example, and then suddenly realize that they still have to pay back the capital later. Um, OK, in a rising market, not so good in a falling market. And we're also finding now that when people actually took out a mortgage, they might have taken out two or three mortgages and, you know, got different lenders involved. So they weren't necessarily telling the whole truth to an individual lender which means that essentially the bank's uh, underwriting portfolios probably have higher risks than them that anybody can understand at the moment. So uh, this is a mess. Yeah, it, it, so there's so many things that are, are just shocking about that. Uh, number one, I don't see how the government can't figure out that they're pulling demand forward from the future. So if you're pulling all that demand forward from the future, what's your growth strategy once you get the incomes to a point where they just cannot sustain any more debt like, like you can only get the prices of homes so high and the interest rates so low before it, it's got to re revert back to the amount of income because at the end of the day correct me if i'm wrong but you actually use income to pay a mortgage <laughs> they're kind of tied at the hip right there. <laughs> you know? well you think so wouldn't you yeah. i mean you know isn't isn't that how it works <laughs> I, I thought so maybe, maybe yeah, not yeah. Maybe, maybe you can just increase the balance sheet to infinity and beyond and you never have to worry about the income to pay off the liability side of the balance sheet. Maybe I'm just stuck in the, the old school. I, I, who knows? 
<laughs> well, it's interesting because I used to work in a bank and, you know, I used to think three and a half times income. That's about right. You know, 20, 30 years. Yes, you can pay it down. Pay it down as quickly as you can because uh, debt, debt is actually not helpful. It's actually a bit of a burden, right? Now, there are many people who say, no, 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 I don't think it's like, about like that. I just say, as long as I can service it, right? I don't care about repaying the capital, right? It'll still be there when I'm 60, 70, 80, 90 or when I die. So, so they don't worry about paying it off. That's one of the philosophical changes I think that many people have. And I'm worried about that because I think debt ultimately has to be paid, you know, whether it's corporate debt, for whether it's government debt or whether it's individual debt, there is a debt to be paid. And I think the, the other interesting thing about that is that many people I survey just say, look, if I don't get in today, I'll never get in tomorrow because prices were continuing to rise and oh the banks were willing to lend. So, yes, it was fear of missing out. And then now suddenly it's fear of not getting out, which is the other, the other thing happening. But the, the truth about Australia, the truth about Australia is that the growth engine has been migration, right? For okay. years and years and years, we've just been putting more and more people in. So we've got this uh, big... Uh, um, Australia strategy. So if you bring more people in, that creates a bigger economic pie. And that basically means that you can keep this thing alive for a lot longer, 300,000 last year and the, the year before. Trouble is, they all are tending to concentrate in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and a couple of other places. So the uh, lifestyle and, you know, congestion has just gone through the floor. It's just very, very uncomfortable. A lot of people now being forced to live in high rise, often very poorly constructed you know, high rise um, environments. And, and frankly, uh, we've created a bit of a monster for ourselves. Um, my own view is that the migration really has been the cornerstone of growth in Australia. Uh, it's very, very lazy strategy. We haven't invested in innovation. We haven't addressed it in, you know, addressed manufacturing locally. We've just basically said, right, we'll uh, take uh, resources out the ground, sell them to China. We'll get lots of people to come into the country and we'll just uh, grow the size of the economy that way. And it's a very lazy strategy. Yeah, it's like the path of least resistance type thing. It, it's just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. It, it's like, it's just the movie, The Big Short. It's like, not only do you see it in the United States, but there's literally a movie of how this plays out. It, it's, it's no secret. But also, it, too, it just... The first thing that strikes me is the misallocation of resources when you're talking about the banking system allocating all their time and energy into what is just most profitable and most convenient for them. And they know the government's most likely going to backstop it. So why on earth should they allocate any of their human capital or their resources to a, a business or a small business or a mid-sized business or manufacturing which should be the, the the focal point of the econ or of an of a healthy economy, I should say. And then you just do that for 10, 20 years. And the next thing you know, you've got this bubble economy that's just built on nothing but a, a foundation of sand. It's just it's the exact same thing. It seems like every developed economy across the the, the world has just taken a page out of the exact same playbook. Well, it's partly driven by the international regulatory framework, right? If you think of Baal, right? Baal actually positively orientates risk such that effectively it's cheaper for banks to lend mortgages relative to lending for business purposes, right? Uh -huh. I, think, I think the international structures is part of the problem here because what we've actually got is a system that rewards lazy lending for mortgage purposes and doesn't reward uh, lending for productive creative purposes, which creates more value. So I, I keep arguing that in Australia, we've got more and more of a service economy. So the same dollar goes around the system again and again and again, because we're not creating much new value. I mean, other than a bit, a bit of resource and a bit of export uh, of agri agriculture, we haven't invested in our future and we haven't invested in our local companies and banks really are not that interested in, in, in supporting that. So one of my thoughts is we need a almost a national bank. We need a bank that's specifically set up to lend and to support business investment for the future because we can't just allow, you know, the, this expansion of consumer debt ad infinitum. We're reaching the limits. There's a, there's a limit to how much people can and are able to service. And, of course, now it's all the tide's gone out, right? to quote Warren Buffett, and you can see swimming and what they're swimming in, and it's not looking very pretty.
Yeah. What do you think about Richard Werner? I don't know if you you followed his work, but I know he's really adamant about taking the banking system and decentralizing it into more community banks that are more in tune with what the local needs are. And then they keep that debt on their balance sheet as opposed to selling it off to, you know, here, Fannie or Freddie or something like that. It, 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 have you followed his work, number one? And if so, what do you think about that approach? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm aware of the idea of, uh, you know, coming back to you know, meat and potato banking, right? Basically yeah, says, right. you know, there, there, was, there was a reason for banks, but banks are not there to make profits in their own, to, to their own ends. They are there to facilitate and enable the productive use of capital in the local community. And that seems to me to be a perfectly legitimate uh, argument. The question is how you get there when right. in Australia we basically have four major banks who are backstopped by the government, you know, they've got, uh, they can call on the Reserve Bank and they'll get liquidity whenever they need it. And of course, in the last month or two, the Reserve Bank says, hey, would you like some more money? We'll give you some more money so you can just lend a bit more out, you know. Um, so th this, this requires a fundamental transformational view of what banking is about. And the problem we've got is that banks are actually very profitable. And of course, shareholders love that. And, uh, a lot of those um, shareholders, by the way, are international shareholders as well as local ones. But the other catch is that those very large banks also are now flowing a lot of their dividends into, um, you know, superannuation funds, in other words, pensions. And, and, and so it's got a bit of a sort of a, a, a circle that it's going to be hard to break. Um, right. But my own view is you have to find a different banking model. You have to go back to what banking is about, which is essentially enabling and facilitating productive investment in the local community. And I think that has to include uh, the business sector. You know, you could argue that with the um, issue of, you know, climate and all those things and the need to actually think differently about the broader economy. Well, part of it is going to have to be differently thinking about the way that banks work and banking works. And I think that getting closer to the ground is a, you know, a good argument. I think it's like going back to the future. Just like the you know, get in your DeLorean and go back to, to the 1980s or 1950s or whenever it was when mm -hmm. we just had, I don't know, maybe I'm naive, but it just seems that the free market, if you just leave it to its own devices and you don't backstop the banks, you let them go bust, you, you let the equity get wiped out. And it's just so you take a more prudent approach to banking where the CEOs or the executives, whomever is making the decision, they all have skin in the game. And it's up to the individual uh, consumer who's giving their money to the bank as 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 a, really a lender. You know, they're the creditor, the person when you set up a bank account and the bank is taking their money as a fiduciary. It's up to them to research and find out about the balance sheet of XYZ Bank, XYZ Local Community Bank, to make sure that you're putting your money or you're giving your money, you're lending your money to an institution that is extremely prudent. I think if we just did that, and, and instead of, like in the United States, we have the FDIC. And that's my beef with the FDIC, is it just allows people to be intellectually lazy. And, and yes, it backstops things, but in the long run, is that a good thing? Or on net balance, is that a bad thing? So I just, um, and again, maybe I'm just a naive kind of guy who leans toward the Austrian school. But I think if we could just have a free market, let businesses go bust, and uh, put the onus more on the individual consumer, that it would just take care of itself. But of course, that would be less central planning. And we know that's probably the, we're going in the opposite direction right now. <laughs> You're talking capitalism. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, isn't that the point that effectively capital, you know, that the idea of capital is it's created and destroyed based on, you know, risk and reward. Um, right. But as soon as you start putting controls and regulations and all those other things in place, and as soon as you tilt the balance uh, of, 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 the, of the playing field so that effectively some win and some lose, um, you just you destroy the basic principle, and that's what we've done. So we we actually don't have capitalism, I think, working in in any Western countries now. We've got more and more central control. We've got more and more of the, the you know the the central bankers and the regulators trying to control what's going on, and uh, you know underpinning this and supporting that and throwing money over there. And uh, we we have lost the plot. And you know I I go back. I I was a, a banker years ago, and I remember um, at that time the bank manager was seen on the same level as as the vicar, you know, and, and the doctor in, in the local community. They were respected 
pillars of the community who would be providing sage advice and help for people trying to get ahead, right? And, and now bankers are regarded as the, <laughs> the lowest of the low. Um, and by the way, they've been, I think, you know, consumed by a generation of mathematicians and, you know, creative people who've put all their intellectual energy into the financialization and uh, the, the cross leverage of this. And, you know, w we have lost the plot. We have to go back to a simpler, more direct form of banking, in my view, because, you know, finance is important and it can help people to do things, but not the way it's currently configured because it's become an end in itself. And that's my, you know, my, my real beef is we've now got a financial sector which is too big. Uh, it's focusing too much on the creation of its own uh, wealth. It can influence too much the political agenda. So if you look at the, uh, you know, the, the revolving doors between the heads of the banks and the heads of the supervisors, you know, right. all of this it is a self-perpetuation machine that is actually essentially making it harder and harder for real people to get ahead. It's got to change. Yeah. And what do you think? I've I've just done a couple of videos recently where I've talked about how central planning, the more you have, the less price discovery you have. Because I think for the average Joe and Jane out there, they hear central planning and they're like, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's not too bad of an idea. I mean, I'm the the head of my household, and I know if I let my kids make all the decisions, that would be disaster. So it's easier if you have fewer cooks in the kitchen. So it kind of makes sense to me. But the the pieces of the puzzle they miss is price discovery and and or or the um, information and the data that we get from individual prices. And if the government is manipulating like an interest rate, which is the price of money, in essence, they're manipulating every single price of every good in an economy. And then how do you know you don't get those price signals that tell entrepreneurs where to send their goods and services, what to make more of and what to make less of. Can you go into that a little bit? Because I think that's really the key for guys like you and I who want to argue against central planning. I think that's the way we have to do it to make it more real for most people. No, you're right. And, and you know, if you think about the way that um, uh, decisions are taken at the moment, right now, we, you know, there is in Australia, ostensibly an independent central bank who has control of the interest rate lever, right? But if you actually look at the way it works, um, the central bank sits around the table with the government and a couple of other regulators through this thing in Australia called the Council of Financial Regulators. So they are basically sitting in a room and calling the shots, right? right. They're basically saying, well, we should take you know, interest rates down or we should take them up or we should uh, loosen lending standards or tighten lending standards. Uh, it, it, it's like sort of sitting in a cockpit and just sort of pulling the levers. And uh, yeah. I think that those guys have got you know, the wrong attitude because basically I don't think that they can control what they think they're controlling, firstly, right? But secondly, you're right. You, what you're doing is you're basically taking away the market. You're basically not allowing the market to be the market. You are basically saying, okay, we're going to pull it this way or that way. Now, their argument is they're doing it for the for the greater good and, you know, for the benefit of, of Australians. Um, but I have to say, if I look at what I see around me at the moment, it hasn't worked very well at all. Yeah, but and, their intention. Um, see, that's what where I always get frustrated with people that that like more government control is they say, well, look, the, the this it, it there's it's supposed to do this, it's supposed to do that. Well, yeah, the intentions are good. I'm not going to dispute that. But let's not look at the intentions. Let's look at the results. And when you look at the results of what they're actually doing, typically with government, it's the opposite of what was intended. That's exactly right. And, you know, the question is, who are they actually acting for? That, that's what I come back to, right? So who are they really, really interested? And, and frank, frankly, politicians are only interested in getting reelected and right. they will do whatever it takes to win that next election. They'll say whatever they want to say. They'll actually tell whatever lies they want to tell simply to get reelected, right? And then the central bankers who claim to be this sort of, you know, holier than thou, the people who actually have got all the answers, all the questions, right, are so myopic in the way that they think about what they do. You know, they've got this view, as I said earlier on, about how banks work, which is that, um, you know, basically it doesn't matter how much loan, uh, how many loans you have, you know, what the size of the debt is, it's it, it's not an issue. Whereas I would argue that debt's actually in the size of the debt's really important. Um, and if you talk to individual households and if you talk to individual business, I survey businesses too, they are absolutely frustrated because they cannot get 
the basic help that they need to be able to actually take their business to the next level. And, and so there is a complete disconnection between the theoretical frameworks and the, you know, the sort of the management processes that are being used in government and, and central banks and the real economy. And I, I get more and more frustrated about the fact that the real economy is not actually getting the benefit. So, yeah, we have to find a, a different way. And I think it does have to come back to price discovery. It has to come back to you know, risk and reward. It has to come back to, you know, get your get your hands off this stuff and let the market be the market. Because ultimately, it's clear to me that trying to do central planning takes you, you know, well, into a communist regime. Is that where we want to be? Because I think that's quite actually where we're quite close, really. We, you know, people's calling the shot centrally and saying, thou shalt. That's not the sort of society I want to be part of. Yeah, exactly. Well, that takes us into another area of discussion, which I wanted to bring up, and that's this ban on cash. I know it's something that I, I, I really don't like, and that, that's an understatement. But from what I'm hearing from my viewers in Australia and on Twitter, that uh, you guys have gone a lot further down that path than we have even in the United States. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so this whole cash ban thing's quite interesting. So it started um, a couple of years ago. There was a, a black economy task force in Australia that was looking at, uh, quote, tax leakage, right? And it was actually um, run by one of the uh, major accounting firms um, uh, for the government. Uh, and it was a, a program that came up with an interesting conclusion to say, well, there's actually, you know, billions of dollars that is being effectively taken out of the economy through the back door, through the black economy. Now, they never really quantified precisely what the levers were that were creating that, and they never actually went into a lot of detail. But one of the things that they said was, you wanted to control the amount of tr cash transactions in the economy. And so uh, a little bit later, in fact, uh, our current prime minister, when he was treasurer, brought a bill into parliament called the cash ban bill, which basically said, look, we want to ban cash transactions above $10,000 between companies and individuals, individuals and companies, um, because we think that that's actually um, going to stop uh, a lot of criminal activity and, you know, gangs and everything else, and it will actually stop tax leakage. That's, so that's that was how they always that, sell. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, when you actually think about it uh, and then start digging below the surface, point one, they never actually worked out what they might save um, if, if they actually did that. Point two, we know from around the world where, that where that's, this has been done, um, it has had no impact on the so-called black economy. In fact, people have just gone around it, so it doesn't. But, but what it means is that individual people who want to do, you know, stuff today that they can do with legal tender. So if I've got a, a wad of banknotes and I want to go and buy something, I can, I can do that. They're taking that freedom away. And whilst they might put a $10,000 uh, thing there to start with, the fact is that around in other countries, it tends to come down and down and down and down and comes down partly because inflation, but also partly because they, they take it down in some European countries, it's $1,000, $2,000. So what that means is that you are being forced to effectively transact within the banking system. Right, right. And that's my first objection. So basically, you're losing a civil liberty you have today to essentially use cash the way you want to use cash, right? You're being forced into the banking system. And guess what? The banking system often will charge you for making those payments. So effectively, you suddenly are paying the bank something on the way through, which you weren't, weren't today. And of course, the banks love it because they want to you know, put their arms around more and more of the, uh, of the economy. The third point is there's a, a degree of surveillance here because how are you going to be, how they're going to know that you did actually do that, right? How did they, you know, so, so you actually, they've got to be some way of looking at transactions. And one of the questions we asked was, how are you going to know, you know, and they said, well, well, you know, well, people will, um, you know, if, if they see a bad transaction, they'll report it. I think, oh, yeah, sure. I can see that working. So so it takes you into a surveillance environment. So right. guess what? Um, if you've got money in the banking system and you make transactions, they'll know anyway because the transactions are electronic records. So it's part of, if you like, a surveillance story. But then there's another issue here. And this is what the IMF, I think, uh, last year, they issued a paper in the year before. They said, look, when interest rates... Um, uh, are where they are, and you have a financial crisis, you need to take interest rates down. You need to take interest rates down four or five percent to get a bit of a kick to the economy to be able to get get it to come right. Now mm -hmm. that's okay when interest rates are five, six, seven, eight percent. But when interest rates are one percent or below, which is where they are now, um, you have to go negative. Right. And they went on to say, if you go negative, 
um, and you effect effectively start charging people to hold deposits in the banks, then people will actually take their money out of the banking system, logically speaking, because why would you hold money in a bank and lose value holding it in the bank? So, so they said, well, what we have to do is we have to find a way of limiting the ability to be able to pull cash out of the banking system so that effectively you can take rates negative. So that's another concern I've got, that effectively this is a this is a policy that can give you access then to negative interest rates and uh, frankly, you know, being uh, forced effectively to pay to keep your um, deposits in the bank. And look, there are examples in Germany and other places where banks are now charging depositors for holding money in the bank, which is, right. you know, completely... Weird, weird and about face. So that that's another point. And then the final point is, if you put all that together, and you think about the digitalization of society, and the fact that essentially more and more things are being created digital, this is part of that overall move, where effectively, you know, you almost go around with a bar barcode on your on your forehead, and you know, everything that you do is being tracked. And I think that civil liberties issue is also a big one too. So from a civil liberties perspective, from a um, freedom perspective, from a, you know, monetary standpoint, all of those reasons um, suggest to me that this is a really bad thing to be doing. Now, we actually managed to get three and a half thousand people to put uh, complaints into Parliament about this. Never had so many, you know, they normally run an inquiry and get 20 or 30, right? And and the Treasury, when they got this three and a half thousand, almost denied that people were actually complaining about it. But then they did another inquiry and we got more, another two and a half thousand people to write and, and basically complain again. And now politicians before the, um, the, the current crisis were being hit left, right and centre by people saying this cash ban doesn't make sense. It's not Australian. So, so far... The bill which was due to come in one January has not come in. And now, of course, it's all got sort of caught in so far that uh, Parliament's not meeting now. But, you know, this is this is for me a really important philosophical point about where we're going to take uh, finances and the way we use money and, and cash. And I think that from a personal freedom standpoint, we should absolutely resist this. Oh, man, I could not agree more. A couple points I want to make. And whenever I see the IRS or a tax authority talk about how much leakage they have, how much people, how much money they're losing, right, that people are not paying that they actually owe. You know what I find fascinating is they never talk about the people who overpay. And if you think about it, I guarantee you way more people overpay their taxes inadvertently than pay too little. Because they don't know the difference. They don't know that they could have taken a deduction over here or over there. Or you get into a situation like I've had a, a couple of my family members where they get a tax bill from the IRS to their accountant, let's say. And let's say the bill's for $5,000 US. And they know they don't pay it and, or that they don't owe it. And the accountant says, no, you don't owe this at all. And then you go back to your accountant and say, okay, how much am I going to have to pay you to fight this and win. Well, you're gonna to have to pay me about 10 grand. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and just pay the 5,000 even though I don't owe it. And that happens constantly, all the time. And I know that because before I retired, I don't know if you noticed I retired in 2012, but I was an entrepreneur for many years. So I hung around a lot of other entrepreneurs. And as you know, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you're just, is this worth my time to battle with the IRS for 10 grand? No, I'm just going to cut them a check. So when you combine that with all these other people that should be taking these deductions and they're not just because they don't know any better, I guarantee you, whatever tax authority it is, they're getting paid too much, not, not too little. The, the next thing I wanted to touch on and I'd love to get your opinion on this because of your background in banking. I was thinking through this the other day, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if we go to negative interest rates to where checking deposits have like a negative 2 3%, doesn't that completely flip the balance sheet of a bank? Meaning right now, a bank makes money, or they should, uh, uh, on the asset side of their balance sheet, which are loans. And then they, their, their, uh, their costs are the liability side of the balance sheet, mostly deposits. So if they're making money off of the, the deposits and they're losing money 
off of the loans, doesn't that just flip? I mean, how perverse is that? How can the banking system exist where they're not incentivized to make loans because the more loans they make, the more costs they have? Yeah, well, um, there was a really interesting paper that uh, came out of um, the uh, Eurozone, and they made the point that when interest rates get very low, banks essentially can't actually take deposit rates lower because effective people just take money out of the banking system, right? Which means that they're actually limited on how far they can go on the deposit side of the balance sheet. And yet they, they are basically giving uh, loans out at very cheap rates, which means that as rates come down, they tend to want to lend less rather than more which means that effectively you're taking banking the wrong way. The second point is that they tend to try and um, bolster profitability by taking more risks and doing things like derivatives and other speculative activities because core banking basically is no longer profitable. Right. Now, if, if you take what you've said further and say, well, in, ne in the negative rate environment, you're making all your money off deposits. So basically, um, uh, what's a bank I there for? Yeah, yeah, why I make a loan when it's just an, an expense? Yeah, ex exactly right. And and so yes, I think people haven't thought through the the full implications and consequences of of negative interest rate policy. And I think it's again one of these central bankers' theoretical discussions. But you know, on the ground, I don't think it's going to you know it's going to play well at all. And the other point I just want to come back to was yeah. you, you mentioned the people were paying you know too much tax. The other point is many corporates are not paying their fair share of tax, right? And in fact, in Australia, there's something like a hundred to one relationship between the so-called um, you know, black economy leakage from the small end of town and the fact that large corporates aren't paying what they should be paying. And so my argument would be, if you really want to deal with tax leakage, put your effort and energy into large corporates and what they're doing, not the small guys. Yeah, exactly. You've got the, the, the average plumber with his with his little business and he doesn't you know he's just going down to the local h and r block or whatever uh little tax service on the corner yeah. and they don't yeah. know up from down where you've got this huge corporation and they've got a fleet of accountants <laughs> that are going through and scouring their books it's just a total unfair advantage and it just stacks things in the favor of the huge corporations instead of in the small and mid-sized business where it, it really should be. And in, in my opinion, in a proper capitalist free market society, you've got two, let's call them big corporations and then the small guys. We'll just uh, compartmentalize into two categories. And each of those should have their pros and cons. And with the, the big company, you've got economy of scale. You've got a lot of resources. But the little guy or little gal has mobility. And so that's those are the two competing factors that should be there all the time. But if you just put all of the advantages onto the shoulders of one of those groups, then you cannot have a, fun, a function or properly functioning economy. What, what do you think about that? I agree with you. And if you look at small businesses and the amount of ministrivia that they have to deal with these days, you know, we have quarterly returns and, you know, GST returns right. and all those things. I mean, the, the amount of stuff you have to do as a small business uh, relative to, you know, what you're generating it, it is just completely wrong. Um, yeah. You know, and, as you say, large organizations have, you know, accountants and everything else and they can all do it. But effectively, we are being uh, dictated to on a set of terms that will be fine for big business, but as small businesses, you know, and I, and I survey a lot of small businesses, they are just completely over it because they don't have time. You know, they're, they're trying to run their business and yet they've got all these additional um, administrative overheads that creates no value for them. Uh, it just happens to make government a bit easier. Yeah, and the corporations vote for that. They want the additional regulations because they have the resources to handle that, but they know that it creates a barrier of entry for all these little people to compete with them because they just can't, because they can't handle all the admin costs. And so you wonder why these big corporations vote for all of these additional laws and regulations. That's why, because it insulates them from competition. Well, let me tell you the way I think I, th I see the world, right? I see government and big business and the financial system on one side of the ledger. Right, right. right. And I see the rest of society, r the real economy, you know, households and, uh, and small businesses on the other side. That's the way that things are set up. And so effectively you've got this self-reinforcing structure where large companies, government, 
financial system all work together and su support their own interests. But it doesn't actually hit Main Street. It doesn't hit real people. It doesn't you know, help actually um, people to get ahead. And that's the ultimately important thing we need to understand. There has to be a redefinition, I think, of some of those things. Because at the end of the day, I remember somebody from the, re from, from the Bank of England some time ago said, do you realize in a crisis, the only people who end up paying ultimately are households, right? right. There is nobody else. Right. So households pay through their taxes. Households pay because they lose superannuation or pensions. Households pay, you know, because they lose deposits or whatever it is. There is Inflation. nobody else. Inflation. Yeah, exactly right. And, 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 it's, and it's like the truth is that households backstop everything. Yeah. And, but, and yet we are seen it right at the end of the process rather than at the beginning. So I think there needs to be a complete flip about. Right. And basically what we should be doing is seeing that government big business and finance are supporting us and what we're trying to achieve as the community rather than actually being, you know, something that's out there and, you know, they don't really want to talk about us. They don't really want to talk about the, the households and businesses. You know, I suppose I've got, got to mention it occasionally, but really it's all about this other stuff. We've lost the plot. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. In fact, in a few of my recent videos, I've been calling the real economy the bastard stepchild because it's <laughs> yeah. like, Fed, you know, there's over there with the Oh, do I have to deal with that real economy again? Damn it. Why are they there? You know, just a nuisance to me. Why can't they just go away and leave me alone so I can just focus on the big banks and the corporations and money printing and QE and negative interest rates? So, did, yeah. you see, did you see the, the Fed, every time they put out a release, they kept saying, for households and businesses? Yeah, exactly. And that's how it starts. Like, yeah, somehow the commercial paper market is for households and businesses, like the subway down the street or the gas station is going to benefit somehow from one of these four-letter programs that the Fed is coming up with. Just utter nonsense. It's just such yeah. a PR move for smoke and mirrors. It, it really... It, it drives me crazy. And but that brings us to another talk. I know we're ah, shoot, we're running short on time. Mark, we, we got to do this periodically because this is just a fantastic conversation. But before I I forget or we run out of time, I, I want to make sure I ask you about something I've been working on in my videos. And that's uh, Professor Steve Keen's idea of a debt jubilee. And I know most of my viewers are, are Austrians or they kind of lean that way, and I do as well. But I've got a ton of respect for Steve. He's a great guy. I've had him on the Rebel Capitalist show before. And I think his concept of this debt jubilee for um, the average Joe and quantitative easing for Main Street, I, I don't know if I totally buy into it because I'm very concerned about unintended consequences, moral hazard, how would you pull it off, and boy, it just, it, it doesn't seem like long-term it would, there, there's not going to come back to bite you in the butt. But what do you think of uh, Steve's proposal on that? Have you researched it all? Yeah, well, Steve and I have uh, actually recorded quite a few shows together. He actually came okay, and visited great. my studio here when he was last in Australia. And look, he's got a very important point, which is that we've got ourselves into a debt level. I asked him, how much debt is too much debt? And he basically said, it's probably a quarter of what we've actually got in Australia, right? So essentially, we know that unless we take a radical move and deal with it, we've got a systemic structural problem that we're never going to solve. So therefore, you can't just assume that there's going to be a business as usual, pay it off over 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 200 <laughs> years, right? There has right. to be a reset. And, and the question then is, well, how do you do the reset? And, you know, the Jubilee is, is, is one way of doing it. There's the Chicago school that basically says, well, what you do is you you take assets down and you take loans down and basically you restructure a one on a one off and then you create a, you know, a, a different structure for the future. There are different models that are out there. And um, uh, the bottom line is that people should take some responsibility for the loan decisions that they take. But frankly, they were in an environment where they were being fed the line that it was great to do it. And, you know, you're helping the economy. Um, as we discussed earlier on, it was part of an intentional strategy to blow up the economy, right, and get it bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but it's not sustainable. We have to get back to a sustainable level of debt. And I think that probably means that we have to see home prices drop and loans drop 
so effectively we get back to a more standard level again. Now that's going to be really painful because people have felt wealthy for quite a long period of time because they saw this, you know, number get bigger and bigger and bigger. But of course, in in reality, it was just an illusion. It wasn't real. Um, it was just, you know, inflation um, effectively just uh, changing the value differentially to what you thought it was. But yeah, we've got to come back to a, a fundamental thing. And I actually think that Steve is onto a very important point, which is you got to think differently about this debt. You can't just assume that debt is always going to re repay. And I spoke to uh, Michael Hudson some time ago, and uh, Michael is a really, really you know, in interesting guy. And he said, look, do you understand that every time you bail out you know, the big end of town, the people who get hit are the small guys, right? right? And in fact, you end up with more, less and less of the real economy supporting everybody else. And so his view was there has to be a point where essentially it's reset. And he actually went went through history and said, look, in, in the old days, they used to actually have that as part of a deliberate strategy because actually it was better for the economy and it was better for individuals and it was better for everybody else too. So there is actually some history to suggest that it can work. And, um, you know, how you actually execute it is the question. But the problem is you've got a lot of uh, you know, neoliberalists neoliberal who won't accept it because basically they say you've got a debt and you must repay it to the last cent. I don't know where I, I stand there because I, 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 I'm sympathetic to that, to where what, what I'm sympathetic towards is that there's no free lunch. And it's hard for me to understand how we can just wipe away a debt or print money and just have more consumption as a result without the productivity. On the other hand, I, I totally understand the burden that the that the real economies uh, under, and I totally get Steve's point where if you want economic growth, it, it it's not going to come in the real economy from just bailing out the the financial system through quantitative easing, where the only thing it does is create more bank reserves. It's just you're just cleaning up the balance sheet of the primary dealer banks. And if you're not cleaning up the balance sheet of the individual consumer, well, they're not going to take out any more loans, even if the even if the balance sheet can handle another 10, 12 trillion dollars worth of loans. It's not going to happen if the consumer's maxed out. So I, I totally get that point. I'm just having a hard time reconciling or reconciling everything to uh, a plan. I just, you know, what I think is going to be the end result is I don't think the the Fed is going to have the 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 huevos, let's say, to take that type of approach, even if they thought it was the best do is they're just going to continue to be the buyer of last resort. They're going to continue to be the lender of last resort. They're going to peg the yield curve. They're going to do some sort of MMT or helicopter money, most likely a UBI on a long term basis, which is going to what they're going to try to create uh, inflation to just gradually do a debt jubilee, if you will, through 10 years of uh, call it 1970s type of inflation. And then at the end of that 10 years or 15 year period, now all of a sudden you've reduced the debt load by 50% if all goes well. Uh, even with that, because it's a more controlled and centralized approach, I think it's gonna create more unintended consequences that are gonna be even worse. I think the end game for me is really the market takes over and forces the Fed or the, the, the government to really just take a back seat and it forces the entire market to go through and take the medicine that we've been trying to avoid since call it the late 80s in the United States where Greenspan came in and, and created the Fed put in the first place and just tried to paper over every single asset bubble with an even bigger asset bubble. And now we're in the everything bubble so where do you go? And I think the, the end game might be, ironically, the inflation that they're trying to create. Because if they get the inflation rate up to call it 10%, well, great, you're wiping away the debt. But if it gets up to 15, if it gets up to 20, well, how do you do that if you have to peg the yield curve? And the only tools that the Fed has at their disposal are artificially low interest rates and money printing. Well, if you use either of those tools against inflation, 
you're just going to exacerbate the problem. And then the Fed paints themselves into a corner where they're completely impotent. They can't do anything. And now all of a sudden, it's time for the market to take over. What do you think of that end game scenario? <laughs> I think it's, it's certainly one. I actually of the view we could actually be looking more at the deflationary depressionary cycle rather than the inflationary cycle. And I look at Japan, right? And I look at what's gone on there because they've been at this longer than anybody else. You know, the Bank of Japan has been buying stocks so they've been buying everything that moves pretty much yeah. for a long, long time. And it hasn't worked, right? Now, if, if the deflationary story is right, then essentially you end up with uh, you know, um, massive amounts of debt that are completely stranded because there's no way that that can actually ever be repaid. Um, if you get an inflation review, then the first thing that happens in interest rates will have to go up to some extent because, you know, as, infl in, as inflation rises, you can't leave interest rates where they are. If they and that's going to then peg it like World War II. Uh, yeah, maybe. But I wonder whether that will translate to higher mortgage rates or not. And, you know, even, even a half a percent yeah. up on the mortgage rate, right, right. that would kill that would kill many, many people, you know simply because of the fact that they're, they're, they're just they're not earning and they're not earning enough. So so you're almost damned if you do, damned if you don't. But I agree with you. There should be a resurgence of real market forces. Right. Because it's tr I believe that the more they've tried to tinker and they've tried, you know, it's a bit like the uh, finger in the dike story. Right. You sort of, you know, one yeah. hole there and then another hole there. And I, <laughs> exactly. I've, run, I've run out of fingers. Exactly. All right. Toes. Now. Now right. what next? <laughs> Right. Uh, and it, that, that, that's what I, where I think we are. But it's that fundamental philosophical view that central bankers have about the fact that they can play God and they can actually pull these levers and magically everything will work. Well, actually, reality is messy. Right. Mm. And my belief is that the first thing we should be doing is having a really hard think about what the role of central bankers are, how accountable they are, because they're not really accountable to anybody, you know, and, and um We've got ourselves into a situation because of the fact that they've perpetuated mistakes again and again and again and again. And my worry is they will just go on doing more of it. They'll buy more stuff. They'll just essentially you know, own more and more and more of the economy. And you end up essentially with a state owned enterprise where yeah. everything is owned, controlled, managed centrally. And, right. you know, some, some people will say, well, that's the new world order that everyone was always aiming for. Uh, I'm more of a cock up theory of history than a conspiracy theory of history guy. And I think it's just a, you know, a, a crass mistake based on, frankly, full, poor, poor, poor philosophy, poor execution and an idealistic view of how things work that's completely disconnected from reality. Yeah, absolutely. I just, uh, mm, yeah, I'm, I mean, here in the United States, you know, with all these alphabet soup programs, they're just, in my opinion, they're just a smoke and mirrors type thing to take the private sector balance sheet and move it over to the Fed's balance sheet. So if anyone has to take a haircut, it's the entity that doesn't have a profit and loss. I've been saying that in almost all my videos, but then you just, I don't know, it's not that this is a prediction, but then my thoughts just kind of evolve from there and try to take it to its logical conclusion. And I say, okay, well, if the Fed owns, let's just say all the mortgages, well, then why does anyone have to pay back a mortgage? And if the Fed's goal is just to keep asset prices high and never let them go down, and we'll use the real estate market as an example, well, if I've got a house that's $100,000 and I can't find any buyer, well, the Fed owns my note. So why don't I just sell it back to the Fed? And then the Fed can hire the bank, who was the originator, to maintain the house and just sell it to the next person. And if the Fed is backstopping the loan in the first place, you really don't have to have a credit score. You don't have to have a, a, a source of income. It's just the Fed says, oh, well, are, are you a good guy or a good gal? OK, great. Here you go. Here's the new keys. And you're off and rolling. And then if it, and that person doesn't have to worry about it because they know the price can never go down. And if it does, then you just sell it right back to the Fed. They keep it on their balance sheet. And it's like it's like Bitcoin with the uh, distributed ledger system where that that ledger is held at the Fed or the Treasury. So they're tracking every single transaction and it goes back to the cash ban. Right. And so if, if, if there's if you don't have to get a loan, whether it's a car loan or a home loan through the traditional banking system and it goes to the Fed and there's no worry of loss, 
Well, think about what that does. And then if their goal is to continually expand credit because their Keynesian model tells them that that's what you should do. Well, what I see potentially happening is them just giving everyone not only Fed coins in the form of digital currency, but also like a Fed card. It's like an ATM card that has direct access to the equity you have in your house. And then I see your house being hooked up to like a Zillow type system that has real time data. So as the, the, the perceived value of your house based on the comps goes up, it just gives you additional purchasing power on your Fed card. And there's no, and you don't have to go to the bank, you don't have to get approved because it all goes back to the Fed's balance sheet where there, there is no profit and loss. What do you think about that? <laughs> is that a hell of a sci-fi movie or what? <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, is, ha, hasn't that been a subject of a few movies? No, I mean, th those sorts of, you know, nightmare. And, I, and I, I would regard that as a nightmare scenario, right? Because basically <laughs> what, what you've nightmare. basically done, you, you've given up freedom, right? You, uh, you know, it'll be determined by whether you fit or don't fit uh, the particular behavioral Positive score or whatever. Score. What yeah, what I yeah. did on my video today is instead of a credit score giving you the opportunity to get a loan, the Fed would just look at your social score, <laughs> yeah. and that's yep. how they give you a loan or approve Absolutely. you. Absolutely, yeah, and and that's the point. So basically, you you've lost freedom, right? You've lost the ability to be able to make your own decisions because basically the decisions will be taken for you by the all-knowing great Fed, right? <laughs> I mean, this is this is stuff of nightmares. But I have to say, the technologies exist. To enable it to happen, yeah, right? that's that's yeah, and the philosophical positioning of you know central banks and the Fed included would suggest that they they could do this, and that's that's the thing that I'm worried about. And like I said earlier on, the thing about politicians is they're only interested in their own short term political uh, cycle; they're not really interested in us, so right. they won't resist it. So essentially, it comes down then to will the little guys accept it? Or will they actually turn around and say, no, that's far no further? A bit like the cash ban in Australia, right? Um, frankly, at the moment, there are a lot of sheep out there who just say, oh, well, you know, I'm sure they know what they're doing and just go and watch Netflix again. That's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> it's, it's Seriously, is that if you just walk down the sidewalk of a typical city in the United States and you just ask people what the Fed is, I, I guarantee you 99 out of 100 wouldn't even know. That, that you're even talking about the Federal Reserve. And if you are talking about the Federal Reserve, they they might know they have something to do with interest rates, but that that's really it. And they wouldn't know how that would affect the economy. And they're absolutely clueless. They're like that frog in the in the in the boiling water that's just gradually getting cooked and they don't even know it. So I think it's all about getting the word out, educating people with channels like yours, hopefully channels like mine, where it can open people's eyes and, and give them the red pill, the economic red pill, to understand that, hey, we need to stand up. We need to make sure that our voice is heard and the people in power right now know that we're not going to put up with any of the, the cash ban or any of these uh, dystopian George Orwell 1984 type of approach to micromanaging an economy, even if it's under the guise of improving safety. Yeah, well, I agree with that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the purpose of DFA, and I know your channel too, is to help people understand more. And, you know, we might not got all, all the answers, but at least we can start asking questions yeah. and get people to actually begin to ask the why question. I'm a philosopher by training, and I keep asking the why question. And wonder, why is it the way it is? What's going on? Why is it behaving the way it is? And then begin to make some decisions because we do have a voice, both individuals and as a community. And yet, if we just continue to be sleepwalking into a future, it could be a nightmare future. On the other hand, if people actually wake up, smell the roses, and begin to take more responsibility for you know what's going on, there is still a good opportunity, I think, to shape things into a different future, a better future. And uh, you know that's what I'm about, and I suspect you're somewhat the same. You got it, buddy. You got it. <laughs> well, Martin, I appreciate your time. It's been a great, great talk. I, I really cannot wait to do this again. For my viewers who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? Yeah, if you uh, come across to my channel, which is actually called Walk the World uh, on YouTube, and I've also got uh, a blog and website at digitalfinanceanalytics.com. All right, Martin. We'll see you next time, buddy.
Yeah, we must do it again. Uh, We've certainly got a lot more to talk about. You bet. 